Okay, John, uh, why don't you give us your background, some of your background. Where, where are you from, uh, and how did you get from there to here? Oh, my. Where I'm from is a little town up in the northern panhandle of West Virginia, just west of Pittsburgh, called Weirton, West Virginia. It was a steel town. And uh, <laughs> it was interesting because that's all I ever wanted to do was be in broadcasting. There was never any question in my mind. Radio was always of interest to me because as a kid, radio was the the booming medium at the time because television was just starting to come in and not everybody had a television we didn't have one in the early days but i always wanted to be in radio and even our local celebrities back in weirton west virginia bob anderson i can remember bill demjohn sam wellington boy tom walters i can remember all of these guys and as a kid i would go down and go to their remotes and and just get a, a glimpse of them and i always there was just something magic about it and so finally, after hanging around the radio station and getting thrown out, and this is a story that so many guys in, in our business have told over the years, hung around, got thrown out, hung around, got thrown out, and finally they hired me as a spotter. Actually, I think it was a volunteer job. And they said, if you're going to hang around, you may as well do something. And I ended up on weekends uh, working Sunday afternoons. Used to get all dressed up in a suit and tie to go down there and work on, uh, on Sunday afternoon. And then... That took me, I went from there to Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, from there to Wheeling, West Virginia, from there to the Marine Corps, back to Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, and worked in radio, went from Beaver Falls, went into television in Youngstown, Ohio, where I was a television news anchor at the ripe old age of 21, worked as a deputy sheriff in, uh, in my off time, and then became assistant news director in charge of radio, and from there... News was always, I was never really interested throughout all of those years. Uh, being a disc jockey in those years was never of any interest to me. I always wanted to be in news. That's why I was a television news anchor. And when I first came to Binghamton back in 1972, I came as news director. Bernard Fianti was the news director of W, in those days, NBF television. And I was the news director of uh, WNBF radio. So that was my primary interest. Uh, was in news and I did that until 1973 when I was offered a job in the public relations department of New York State Electric and Gas Corporation and I left it's like anybody else regardless of how deeply rooted your interests are you always are interested in what it's like on the outside what is what is it like uh, to do something else so there was a certain appeal to the stability of a uh, large corporation like New York State Electric and Gas. And so I left the broadcasting business, went to work in the public relations department, and in six months' time, I found out that that was absolutely nothing that I ever wanted to be involved in. <laughs> I could not wait for the opportunity to get back into broadcasting. The, the strictures of corporate life just were not for me and so we had a new general manager at WNBF his name was Gary Voss and Gary had come here from Huntington West Virginia and he was bent on getting me back on the air but they had already Bill Lau who was my assistant news director when I was there had been made news director and they weren't about to fire Bill Lau to give me a job back so he came to me and he said, in fact, it was kind of interesting. I, I was at home one night and I didn't know Gary uh, he, because I was working at the electric company. And the phone rings and it's Gary Vaughn. No, it was Bill Parker. I'm sorry. It was Bill Parker. And Bill Parker said, John, uh, I'm out at Gary Voss's house. Uh, would you come out here? He lived out in Crestview Heights. I'm working at the electric company. So I go out there in the evening, and I walk in, and there's all these people from WNBF are there in Gary Voss's recreation room. And they said, oh, yeah, this is Gary Voss, this, you know, these guys, is Bill Lau, this is all of these people. And I forget who was the sales manager at the time. Um, maybe Randy Varney, maybe. But anyhow, they're all there. And so they said, well, here's the deal. What we want you to do is we want you to leave the electric company. We've heard you want to, and I'm saying, well, you know, I'm cool. We'll see. And they said, we'd like for you to do the morning show. To bring your news expertise over to the morning show and do that. This was at 74-ish, something like that. 
And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, I really ought to talk to my wife, although I knew there was no need to do that because this is something I wanted to accomplish. And I said, uh, well, if I considered that, newsman that I am, if I considered becoming a disc jockey, a lowly disc jockey, when would you want this to start? And they said, tomorrow morning. <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute. I, said, I got the electric company to deal with, and they said, we'll take care of that. Don't worry about it. So uh, they talked me into coming back, and I had never been a disc jockey. I'd never done, oh, years and years ago. I had been, you know, we played the Angels and the, the, uh, the Dovells and all of those guys. But this was now in the 70s and a whole new era, and they said, well, just we want you to do, come in and do whatever you want to do. If you want to talk for four hours, talk for four hours if you want to, whatever you will feel like doing. So I agreed to do that. And uh, so that's, that was actually uh, my, that was the big break. I mean, that was, that was when I became really well known. And uh, during that period of time, when I started doing that morning show, and it was one of those rare, Carl Wall was my newsman. And it was one of those rare opportunities in a person's life when everything just fell into place and in a performer's life, where in a market, and that's what we call a community in which radio stations are located, we call them markets, it's an inside term. Um, everybody listened, everybody. It was, it was unbelievable. When I wanted to do something, it never failed because there were so many people listening and contributing. And every day when Carl and I went in there, it was an uplifting experience. There was never a down day because the people were waiting to hear from me. They, I was waiting to hear from them. There was just no limit to the fun we could have. And we had fun every single day with Carl with his cigar sticking out of the side of his mouth and, and walking around being Carl. And, and uh, he was uplifting. And, and uh, it seemed like everything we touched turned to gold. Everything that we did. Tom Colley, who was a writer for the newspaper, the late Tom Colley, always seemed to be down on broadcasters. It was always, and it was an understandable thing, because he was a he was a print guy, he was a journalist, and and he was always finding fault with broadcast people. And I'm sitting in a bathtub one Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was my day off, you know, so I'm in there doing whatever. I'm taking a bath, reading the paper, and I'm reading the, the press, the Sunday press. And I look, and there's this headline that says, A Leslie Fan Declares Himself. And it was by Tom Colley. And he's talking about how radio, and he talked about a guy up in Ithaca who had been there for a lot of years, and, and I can't remember the guy's name, but, but then he talks about John Leslie and this young fellow, and, and he's really funny, and I don't think he intends to be, but he really is. And, uh, and in those days, I called Big Ben, Big Ben to hear Big Ben ring. We'll talk a little bit about why I have this because later we actually went there uh, and uh, oh, called. Um, I, I, this was another one of those things that uh, I, I I apologize. I could just go. The story is so long. There is just. I always tried to bring. I go around the country now. We have we're on 250 radio stations with my current company, World Radio. And part of the thing that we do, we go in and we talk to radio salespeople and sometimes the air personalities, and we try to give them, we never give them advice. Advice is the last thing in the world you want to do. We, you let, if they want to know something, then we try to tell them. But we never go in and give them advice. But one of the things I talk about is how over the years I tried to legitimize the profession of being on the air. Because far too often, and it was really fostered by the enormously funny Dr. Johnny Fever on WKRP, of the disc jockey being the guy with the ponytail and the earring and a car with four different size, uh, four different size tires and uh, towing a U-Haul. Uh, he'd blow into town, do his morning gig, and then go on to his next thing. And while there was a lot of that, it was really pervasive in our industry, I always tried to bring a sense of professionalism and and raise the bar on what it what an air personality is as as a lot of the guys that worked at NBF did. Bill Parker always did that. Bill 
always tried to bring a whole a new sense of, of professionalism, as did Bernie Fiati and the guys that I worked with. But uh, anyhow, it, one morning I called, um, I had read where um, Jack, Jackie Kennedy Onassis and Aristotle Onassis had gone off into the, the Mediterranean or the Caribbean or wherever they were, the Mediterranean I guess, in the ship, his, his private yacht. And uh, as I always wanted to do, I picked up the phone and I called the high seas operator and never anticipating that I was going to get through, I said I want to call the Christina, which was the name of the ship. And in, in no time at all, the phone's ringing and the ship's radio operator answers and he's speaking Greek, but he also spoke English. And he said, what do you want? You know, there's this voice way off there. What, you know, what did you want? And I said, I wanted to speak to Aristotle Onassis. And click, 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 he's on the phone with me. He's on the radio, live in Binghamton, New York. And I didn't have anything to ask him. I had never anticipated, ever, that I was going to get through. So I had nothing to ask. And so I just made some real, sm I don't even remember what it was. I thought it was smooth. You know, I thought it was cool. It was like the dog chasing the bus, you know. I caught the bus, and I had no idea what to do with it after I got it. So I finished, and I thought I had smoothed it over. I thought I had done an appropriate job of making it into a good bit. And I hung up, and I looked up, and Carl Wall standing there. And he's got his cigar in his mouth. He's got his tie loose, and he's standing there. And he says, well, we'll never do that again, will we? <laughs> <laughs> this was it that obvious, Carl? <laughs> And uh, I got to admit, now that was 74, 1975, 70, late 74, I guess the, the first ratings came out, and we had a 36 share of the audience. Now, what does that mean? For those of you who may be unfortunate enough to be watching this tape for whatever reason, maybe it's the day after my funeral, I don't know, but um, for those of you who happen not to be in the broadcasting business, a 36 share is unheard of in any radio market in the country. You get to New York City, if you get a two share, a three share, you're, you're golden. If you get to, in a, in a market the size of, say, Syracuse, if you have a nine or a ten, uh, that's unheard of. But in Binghamton, New York, we had a 36 share in the morning. The word spread very quickly. And it wasn't very long. Uh, that I had an offer in Syracuse, so I left. Uh, you know, and I, I'll tell you how much I was making. I was making twelve thousand five hundred dollars a year doing the morning show and dragging in probably in those days about eight hundred thousand to maybe a million dollars in gross revenue for the station. And I remember Gary Voss the day that I accepted the job in Syracuse. And Gary Voss was the general manager, and Gary was make no mistake about it. Gary Voss was the finest general manager that I ever worked for. Make no mistake about it. And I went in to quit. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, if you stay, I'll make you program director. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I said, I thought you were supposed to be enticing me to stay instead of chasing me away. <laughs> I said, I hope that you were going to offer me eight or ten thousand dollars. You can offer me program director's job. Why did you trade a hemorrhoid operation? <laughs> so, I left for Syracuse. We did very well. Uh, and then, I, I've got to, for any of you in the business who are watching this, I've got to tell you that this is the point at which I'm going to be honest. My career in 1975 accelerated. Um, went from Syracuse, where I, that was really the first time in my career that I ever really worked with a professional group of people, where there were real solid pros from morning till night, program director, everybody was a team that had been imported for this. and and. I was there for a year, was attracted to go off to Des Moines, did the morning show in Des Moines, did very well, very well in Des Moines. 
Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Went played country music. Got to tell you a quick story about that. Tell me when I'm going on too far here. This is just... Is that everything all right here? You're doing fine. I, right. I thought maybe in Des Moines you would tell the story about the rich guy that showed up in the street. Wasn't that Des Moines? Oh, that was in Kansas City. Oh, okay. okay. You'll get there yeah, then. That's Bob Huckabone speaking off camera okay. there. It's his camera, so he can talk <laughs> if he wants to. No, that was down in Kansas City. That was the second stop uh, out in the Midwest. But i got to tell you about the... I was offered this job, Stoner Broadcasting, the same company that owned WNBF, wanted me to go to Des Moines. They... They couldn't keep me from Syracuse with the offer of being program director. So uh, after about a year, they asked me if I wanted to go out to Des Moines, and they offered me a considerable increase in pay to go out there. And uh, they said, it's country music industry. I said, I've never been around country music. I don't know anything about country music. They said, you'll learn. And with what you do, it doesn't make any difference because you'll just do your thing, and if you play a country song, that'll be fine. So I... My, I said, okay, and, and we flew out, my wife and I flew out, and we picked out a house, and we accepted the job, and didn't hear the station. So we came back, went back to Syracuse, put our house on the market, bought a truck, loaded our truck up. The moving van was taking our stuff out, but I drove this truck. And we get out to somewhere around Illinois. Maybe we just crossed from Illinois across the border into Iowa. And I said to Amity, I... I bet you we can get KSO. That was the station. 1470. KSO. So I... Sure enough, I get down to 1470. There's KSO playing Drop Kick Me Jesus Through the Goal Post of Life by Bobby Bear. <laughs> I said to Amity, watch for one of those turnaround places here. <laughs> I'm going back home. Well, we didn't go back home. We went on out to Des Moines. And we made friends. And to this day, the friends from Des Moines. Now, this is back in 77. Those people are still... These are non-broadcast friends. I mean, these are just community friends. And we did very... Had a successful run uh, in Des Moines. And for those who are not aware, there's a big... Big 50,000 watt station in Des Moines, WHO, and a lot of famous people, including President Reagan, uh, came out of there. And uh, I was not aware what a showcase Des Moines always has been for talent. So when we scored big with that 26, I had a 26 share in the mornings. First book, went out there, had like a five, and we went up to a 26 share. No thanks to anything that I. You know, God gave me the ability to be me and to um, just be me on the air. And apparently people, in some numbers, enjoyed me being me on the air and enjoyed listening and eavesdropping on my life and having fun. And so as a result of those big numbers, and Des Moines being the showcase that it was, I started getting offers. Uh, and, and I was very uplifted by it. I was, you know, I mean, who wouldn't be? Uh, one day... So help me God. One day I was sitting in the production room, still had the 26 share or not, I still had tags to put on spots and do all that stuff. I'm sitting in the production room at 10.05 or 10 or whatever time. There were three buttons. In those days it was still the old AT&T or Bell phones with the white buttons, you know, that would flash. There were three buttons on hold. One was New Orleans, one was Oklahoma City, and one was Chicago. I had three job offers on hold at the same time, at the same moment. Simply because of those big numbers that we had in the morning. Ultimately, those things did not work out. We were now in a position where we could look and pick and choose. The next move was not necessary. It was to be selected very carefully. And so, as time went on, I had an offer in uh, Kansas City. My mother was up in years, and it was not well, and it was far enough to be halfway across the country. I didn't want to go to Oklahoma City. I didn't want to go to Arizona. But we did select an offer in Kansas City. Went to work for the entertainer Danny K. It was K. Smith Broadcasting at KCKN, Kickin' Country. You ready for that? We had a formidable task, because the number one station in Kansas City was WDAF. 61 country, and they were number one. 
and they brought me in to go against this number one station. In order to effect that change, and this story is far too long to, to tell it in its entirety, but I came up with a scheme where I went, before I ever went on the air, I'm hired, Amity's still back in Des Moines. Amity knows nothing about this. We couldn't afford to tell anybody because we didn't want it to leak out. I went, there's a big plaza in downtown Kansas City called Country Club Plaza. It's a beautiful Spanish motif plaza. It goes for square, city square blocks around. It's beautiful. A lot of businesses down there, not far from the Crown Center, and there are thousands of people every day down there for lunch. Well, we rented a limousine, and I showed up in a business suit. I wasn't wearing a tuxedo. We just tried to throw people off, you know. But I had a shopping bag. And I got out of the limousine the first day, and I had a bag, shopping bag. And in that shopping bag, just a regular grocery bag, I had $2 bills. Not many, mind you. <laughs> I had like 75 or 100 maybe. And I started handing, handing them out to anybody that would take them. And I didn't tell them who I was. Didn't say I was the morning show guy on KCKN. I didn't say anything. I just said, here, would you like a $2 bill? And it worked. And what I said was, if you would like some more, I will be back tomorrow at the same time. Well, it's like the cartoons, the fish taking the hook and just swallowing, you know, gulp. And these people just swallowed it down to their rear end. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so the next day at noon, I'm, we still, I'm still not on the air, mind you. But I come back in the same limousine next day. Now there are television cameras there. We expected that like on the third or fourth day. But the second day, there were television cameras there, and they're grinding away saying, and I'm handing out $2. And now people, the second day, they're taking it. First day, they were a little standoffish, you know, so I'm giving it to the camera guy, and I'm and, and they're saying, and they ask me, you know, why are you doing this? It's because I want to. Why are you giving it out to the people on the street? And I said, well, they were responsible for me having it, and I want them to have it back, looking right in the camera lights. And they, somebody says, one of the reporters says, well, how much is there? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and then he said, well, how long are you going to do this? And I said, until it's all gone. <laughs> it was all I could do to keep from laughing. And they're grinding away, you know, on close-ups of me and the $2 bills and the car. And I gave out my 75 of them or however many I gave out, got in the car and drove away. The newspaper was there, everybody was there. The next morning, across the Kansas City Star morning newspaper, the banner line on the front page, Mystery Money Man, and there's me handing out this money. The banner line, these guys swallowed this thing right down to the gills. And um, I showed up at noon that day. I was very nervous now. Now I was afraid it was out of control. Now I was afraid I wouldn't be able to handle it. And I'm holed up in a hotel downtown. They got me hiding in a hotel. Now they've hired bodyguards to travel with me because the crowd is getting too big. Wednesday I get down there, there's more television cameras. A thousand people all reaching and grabbing and pushing, trying to get at me. We got bodyguards with sawed off shotguns. This may, this, so help me. These guys are wearing black like secret service, glasses, trench coats, guns, the whole thing. And uh, that night, it's on Huntley Brinkley. Mystery Money. He started off, David Brinkley's. We're sitting at, we, where did we go? We went to uh, like a circuit city, only it wasn't because they were didn't exist in those days. The program director took me to this place where all these television sets were on. You know, like 200 of them. You've all seen that, you know, all side by side by side by side. And Brinkley, Huntley. David Brinkley, he's on. And he's in and in whatever year it was, 1917, uh, David Rockefeller was handing out dimes in wherever he was handing out dimes, nearby here. Well, inflation is caught up with philanthropy and the mystery money man, son of a bitch, there's me. <laughs> on every one of those screens. <laughs> on NBC Nightly News. And, uh, and it made it all the way up to the Nightly News. And their, their troubleshooter, Jim Ruddle was his name, had been flown in to find out who I was. Well, 
the next day we knew that we had now reached the crossroads because we were going to take this up to Friday. At which point I was going to say, surprise, I'm the new morning man on Casey Can, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the next day, we there was a helicopter in there somewhere. They took me to the airport and we got in the helicopter and flew away. But anyhow, just to add to the thing. But anyhow, the next day, now that we knew it was blown, now we knew my cover was blown, because once you're on national TV, um, you can't very well keep this charade up. Well, I'll tell you, what's the guy's name? Peter, is it Caffrey? The guy that's on CNN with Paul is on in the morning. Um, I'll, I'll think of his name. But he's McCaffrey? Well, anyhow, he's on now with Paul is on on CNN. He was the news director of a television station in Des Moines. Now I'm down in Kansas City doing this. This is up in Des Moines and it's on his television station. And he's looking and he's and steam, I guess steam is coming out of this guy's ears that, that I've pulled the wool over the eyes of all of these media giants. And he couldn't wait to call up NBC and say, you buffoons have been hornswoggled by this guy. So he, Peter Cafferty, no I don't know what it is. Anyhow, uh, so he blows the whistle on me. Jim Roddle, the NBC troubleshooter reporter who's assigned to all of these things, called me at the station, laughing his ass off. Just he thought that was the funniest thing. He said, "As far as we know, it." He said, "Now bear in mind, Brinkley's not real happy about this." He said, "But he said we think it's funny as can be." He said, "As far as we know, nobody has ever pulled one over on NBC Nightly News." And so now my cover's blown. I had to go down there at noon and. We did a thing. There had to be 20,000 people there at noon that day on Thursday waiting for me. The, the guards could not keep the people away from me. They crushed me against the side of the limousine. Finally, somebody yelled, somebody from the station, I think they were up to like in a second floor window and they had a the bullhorn or something. They said, throw the money in the air because they were crushing me against the car and reaching in the bag and pulling and so on. And my glasses got pulled off and my face was bleeding. And so I threw them, when I tried to throw, there were about nine hands in the bag, but I threw the money in the air and I got in the limousine. I'm trying to say, I'm the morning guy, I'm KCKN, y'all. <laughs> well, by that time it was lost in the frenzy. And uh, so I get in the limousine to make an escape. And there's a reporter from the Kansas City Star sitting in who had gotten in on the other side of the car and was just tickled to death with himself because he got an exclusive interview as we were driving away. I mean, and good for him. He just, he was really clever about it. And he did a story. And that night on, uh, we were out at a place. Now I'm no longer in hiding. Now I can be out. And we're sitting in a, in a bar, I think, for dinner with a bunch of guys from the station. And they had NBC Nightly News on. And Brinkley comes on and he said, Last night at this time, <laughs> we had a story about. Well, it turns out that uh, the two dollar bill, the two dollar mystery money man, is really a three dollar bill. He's a disc jockey starting a new job in Kansas City. So we had a great hoot about that. And uh, unfortunately, after all of that, it didn't do anything for the ratings. If anything, it hurt us. Because <laughs> from then on, regardless of how sterling a promotion we did, the rest of the media in town. Would, would do nothing to uh, to foster. They would do nothing to help us. So we kind of cut our own throat on that. But anyhow, I, w I, I, I had um, a lot of fun working in a major market in Kansas City. It was a, a thankless struggle because that is major market radio with major market uh, budgets and um, we struggled. We, we, I, I did well. The ratings were never there. Those 36s were now 2s and 3s and 4s and and the, um, you go down a quarter of a point or three quarters of a point and your job's in jeopardy. And So in any event, I was offered the morning show at WGY in Schenectady and I just couldn't pass up the opportunity uh, to work at, at uh, what is probably one of the finest radio stations in all of America, in all of the world. KDKA in Pittsburgh was the number one station to go on the air. WGY, as far as anybody knows, was number two. Uh, KDKA was Westinghouse. WGY was General Electric. And so it, it was a, a great place to work. And uh, the income, however, was limited there. Uh, they paid me very well to do the morning show. 
And it was back at, at, precisely at that time in 1980 and 1981 that Ted Bear had been working and doing a, a fine... Everybody thought that Ted and I were great enemies. We were not. We were good friends. <laughs> Ted and I were very close friends. And uh, Ted, for whatever reason, and, and I don't know the reasons, left WNBF and went to WENE and did it with some degree of fanfare. He, he left, I think Carl went and, and some salespeople went, at least one, or I, I don't remember the whole situation. But anyhow, Stoner Broadcasting, who owned WNBF, panicked in their own way. And they said the only way to defuse any possible threat that Ted may have to us over at WENE -E is to bring John Leslie back. And I remember very clearly Kitty Bocock, who was the general manager and a dear, dear woman. She is still a good friend all these years later. We still have occasion to see Kitty, and she was just up here for a party. And, and uh, But I'd never worked for Kitty. I'd heard her reputation, heard about her. She came up, she called me, and she said, uh, my husband Bo and I are going to come up and have dinner with you all. And... Uh, I said, okay, so she comes up to the house in Albany. She and I went in the living room, and she said, she announced to me that she was not going to leave, and we were not going out to dinner until she had my signature on a contract to come back to work at WNBF in Binghamton. And I said, Kitty, I ain't going to do it. My, per my career is on a, an upward trajectory. I'm, you know, Des Moines, Kansas City, Albany. Kitty, next stop's going to be Charlotte, or New York City, or Detroit, or Chicago, or something. Not Binghamton, Kitty. I am not interested. Thank you very much. And she said, I'm not leaving till your name's on a signature. And she started going up and up and up. And she says, I'm not going to stop until you say yes. And she started offering more money and more money and said, what do you want? And it got, so help me, look at this face. Is this a face that would tell you a lie? I became embarrassed because the woman was groveling. And I and I know, I found out later she had orders not to, to come back without a contract. And she got to a point where she offered me so much money that I could not refuse the job. And then I finally, I threw in another thing and I said, and I want a company car and they gave me that and I wanted to trade at the Chef Italia or whatever and they gave me that. And so I signed a contract, and very honestly, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to come back to Binghamton, New York. But I did, and I did it for the money. I, and Stoner Broadcasting told me, they said, if you sign this contract and come back, we guarantee that you will only be there two years until you do the job we want you to do, till you defuse Ted Bear, and then we're going to move you off to another one of our markets, New Orleans or uh, Louisville or one of our bigger markets, Buffalo. Never happened. The same thing happened all over again. The ratings took off, the fun started, and Ted left. We, we, just, we just killed Ted in the ratings, and Ted left. And I got a call from somebody, in a, a guy over at ENE who was the general manager at WENE, and he said, uh, we want to talk to you. Mrs. Merv wants to talk to you. And I said, I'm not interested. And they said, well, I think you'll be interested uh, once we tell you what we have in mind. Well, they flew me out to Los Angeles where I met with Mrs. Merv out there at a restaurant in Beverly Hills, I guess it was. She offered me $98,000. Plus, like, like she cared. I mean, you know, like she knew me. And uh, a car and a bunch of other stuff to, uh, to come to work for them. And I, you know, who would, and that was what, 81, 82? That was a huge amount of money for Binghamton, New York. And I came back, and uh, Kitty found out about it, and uh, they flew me out to Des Moines, where corporate headquarters, the uh, Stoner corporate headquarters were. And they said, uh, what do you need to stay? What do you need to change your mind? And so, using the baseline 
from the <laughs> from the ENE offer, I uh, forged a new contract with uh, uh, Stoner Broadcasting, and came back and I did the show. And um, from that moment on, and was given license to do anything I wanted to do. And I took that that radio program all over the world. Uh, we went to London. That's where this. Uh, this was from our live broadcast at uh, Big Ben. Years earlier, I had called to have uh, somebody hold the window out, hold the phone out the window, uh, so we could hear Big Ben ring. And I thought, well, why not go over and, and actually broadcast lives from there? So we did that. And uh, then uh, that was not our first trip. However, our first trip was to Ireland. And uh, when I the very first overseas broadcast was from Dirty Nelly's Tavern in uh, Shannon, Ireland. And uh, we did St. Patrick's Day from there. And this was something that the group that traveled with us, the group from the east side of Binghamton and a bunch of others from around the area went with us. We had just a marvelous time. And on the way back, they gave Amity and me this uh, uh, model of Dirty Nelly's Tavern where we did the broadcast. This is the one item that I really treasure because this, I don't, I don't, that's not to say I don't treasure the other items, but uh, this one was special to us because it was the very first broadcast. So we enjoyed that a great deal, and uh, over the years, the uh, you know, I went to Nepal. Um, each one of these has a story. I don't know how far we're into this. I don't know how how much of this you guys can gag down, but uh, the trip to Nepal was uh, very interesting. There was a story on the wire, and this is where a lot of us get our leads. This is where, you know. But the thing is that people don't read the wire diligently, and they don't look between the lines or for the opportunities that are there. And and perhaps a lot of people didn't have the latitude that I had to pull these things off. and So I, had, I saw a story that a fellow from uh, Scotland was taking Scottish beer to Nepal to go up into the mountains to uh, attract uh, the abominable snowman, or Yeti as he was called. Uh, and he was going to use it as bait. He said Scottish beer would be the best bait possible to attract this uh, elusive creature. And so again, everything just fell into place. I, ca I called this guy. He was at the Himalaya View Hotel in Kathmandu, Nepal. And I called and I asked for this guy's name. Scott was his name, I believe. Anyhow, uh, I get him. He's on the phone with me. There he is. I'm kind of like the Aristotle Onassis thing. You know, now I got him. And I said, you know, I'm making it up as I go along. Now I got this guy. And he said, I said, well, I think that Genesee beer is better than your old Scottish beer. You know, it would attract more Yeti as far as I'm concerned. And he said, well, with his very proper Scottish accent, let's find out. He said, I can't do accents. I can't do accents. <laughs> he said, get some and come over. Well, he said, I'll meet you at the airport. So I get off the air and I'm thinking, oh my God, now what? Now what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? So I went in to see Kitty, Kitty Bocock, and I said, Kitty, you heard that? She said, I heard it. I said, what am I going to do? She said, you only have one thing to do. you got to go over there. And so, with all due respect and credit to our sales department, in those days, these guys were making a very good living selling WNBF, and particularly the morning show, because they were just raking in the money. And they saw the opportunity to make some more money on this, so they called Genesee. Genesee paid my first class airfare from Binghamton to Kathmandu, Nepal, which was Binghamton, London, London, New Delhi, New Delhi to Kathmandu. They outfitted me. I guess it was Eureka Camping Center outfitted me in mountain climbing stuff. Some of the stuff I still have to this day. It's such high quality stuff. We hired a photographer, Sridhar Mandahar, to accompany me, and I flew over to Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, Mr. whatever Scott I think his name was I can't remember I never did catch up with the guy we he had gone on he went up to the base camp at Lukla and I went into Kathmandu and I spent a day there down at the Yak and Yeti Hotel and uh, do I have any Nepalese things here I thought maybe I might have grabbed something uh, but anyhow the uh, we went up to Lukla which was the base camp and, and so the guy had already gone up into the mountains. So I went up as far as I could in, in a jeep, and they took me up there, and uh, 
we broadcasted, they, they told us, and that, that's the thing, the, the single thing that always made me want to do something was when somebody told me it, could, it was not possible. They said nobody can ever broadcast out of the mountains, the Himalayan, the Himalayan mountains, because of the terrain and so on. Well, I set up this sophisticated system of relays and stuff, and we got this signal back from uh, from Nepal up in the mountains, live on the air. And uh, I remember this one thing in particular. We went out, the the my guide and my cameraman, and we're going up this mountain, up the mountainside there. <clears throat> got out at four o'clock in the morning, and. We're going up, and the, and the guy says to me, and he says, uh, do you want some coffee? And I said, we're in the Himalayan mountains. Where in the heck are we going to get coffee? He said, well, over here there's a, a, sh a shack. Uh, some people, some Sherpas live over here, and uh, we'll get them. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, were, were they sitting over there making coffee? He said, no, we'll get them up. So they go over, and they kick the door, and this woman comes out. Boy. Whew. And she comes out, and uh, he says, we want some coffee. And we go in, and, and she made some instant coffee in her little shack there. I've got slides uh, of it and so then they said all right well let's go outside and we'll take a picture and Shrita Harmandahar a photographer he takes a picture and not till I came back later and we're looking at the slides there's us standing in front of this shack and in the window a little thing in the window is this blue thing that says we take American Express <laughs> so apparently they catered to all of these uh, disc jockeys who travel through there and uh, but anyhow, we went up the mountainside, and uh, there's this big rock sticking out over the cliffside. Over and you go down, you look down, and if you ever fell down there, you, they'd never find you because it's down there. And so they they said, "Well, you got to go out and and get out on that rock so we can take your picture." Well, I don't even like being this tall, let alone standing out on this rock out there. But I go out on the rock, and I'm standing there, and they're taking chuk, 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 chuk. now. Climb over the edge and pretend like you're climbing up and hold your mic and hold your Genesee can. So I look down, there's enough I can get over there, and I I got kind of climbing up there. And so they, in the process of this, they call this thing Tiger Stand. Somebody says, Tiger Stand. And I said, why do you call that the Tiger Stand? And they said, because a tiger lives underneath that rock. I said, you mean like right now? <laughs> and they said, well, we don't know whether he's there now or not, but it could be. I mean, he lives under there. <laughs> so we didn't see the tiger that day. We heard him that night. At, uh, we think it was the tiger. We put out some, you know, we figured as long as we were there, we may as well put out some Genesee beer to see if anything would take it. You know, I mean, I drank it in those days. Couldn't be all that bad. <laughs> So we put it out, and we heard some. Uh, we got some tape of this thing squalling, whatever it was. You know, we, of course, we told the radio audience that it was uh, Yeti coming after the beer. You know? <laughs> uh, but we had no idea what it was, you know. And and uh, so then I found out later that this guy that we were traipsing after was quite a bit of a drunk, and uh, and he uh, probably drank his Scottish beer himself, and, and maybe we had a little of the Genesee beer too. But uh, to this day, to this day, and one of the reasons that uh, this is being videotaped and one of the reasons that it was very nicely asked to do this is because my wife and I are relocating uh, to Florida. We're selling our home in Bestel and we're re after 20 some years in Binghamton, we're going to be going to uh, Florida. And by the time you see this, I may be living back in Kathmandu, but uh, the... Uh, To this day, people, and when we were down looking at our for our new house, when we were planning it and having it built, we met some people from Vestal, and the first thing they said was, "You remember going?" Of course I. Bernie Fiati called me the other day. He said, "And Bernie does this to me." John, what was the name of the hotel you stayed in in Kathmandu? He said, "You remember when you went to the?" I said, "Yes." What was the name of the hotel? I said, "Yakin Yeti Hotel." He said, what was your room number? <laughs> I said, Bernie, I don't know what my room I don't know what my room number was. He said, it was 421. I have it here in my Rolodex. And he hung up. <laughs> what, what a wonderful, wonderful human being. What a pleasure. What a treasure it is in my lifetime 
to have had the privilege of working with Bernie Fionni and knowing this true genius. I say that with every ounce of energy in my soul. He is the most splendid, caring, intelligent, amusing, articulate, gifted individual. And if it had not been for whatever circumstances Bernie chose them to be, Bernie could have been a network anchor. He could have been the interviewer on 60 Minutes. There is no question in my mind that that is the caliber of individual that we're dealing with, uh, with Bernie Fianti. I uh, would be remiss if I did not talk about, and we'll race kind of toward the end here because um, Mark Twain said uh, it's a terrible death being talked to death, and I wouldn't want to be responsible for any of you meeting that demise. But it was in 1987 that Tom Stoner, the chairman of the board of Stoner Broadcasting, who I certainly knew very well, not because he was my great confidant nor I his, but because I'd worked for him for long enough that we knew each other and, and our paths crossed and he was a nice guy. and. Uh, Nonetheless, the consummate businessman. I mean, when you own, in those days, 20-some radio stations, you got to be a pretty good businessman. He owned an outdoor billboard company and a bunch of other things. And anybody who had their own 40-foot yacht, I had it was all right in my book. My, my yacht was only 34 feet. So. But uh, Tom came up from Annapolis. The, the, corporate stoner off, the stoner corporate offices moved to Annapolis. And um, he came up from Annapolis one day to see me. And Kitty said, no, Roger Conklin. Roger Conklin was the general manager then. Roger said, Tom Stoner is coming to Binghamton. I said, eh. He said, to see you. I said, about what? He said, I don't know. So uh, Tom and I met in the cafeteria or the lunchroom of the Security Mutual building. And he said to me, I want you to go to Russia. And I said, Russia? What? For what? He said, that's up to you. He said, he went on to explain to me that, uh, now, if, just a little history lesson. This was, I'm sorry, this was 86, because we didn't actually do the project till 87. Your history lessons will tell you that it was 1986 that Mikhail Gorbachev introduced the notion of glasnost, new openness, and perestroika, reconstruction, in the old Soviet Union, the old evil empire. And Gorbachev, who, by the way, was a communist through and through, there was no question about it. He was not. He was no Democrat. He was a. He was a communist through and through. Um, but he realized that in order for Russia to survive in the world economy, that they had to do something. They had to open. They had to change. They had to reconstruct. And so Tom Stoner said to me, and he confided in me, and I don't think I'm violating any confidence because we talked about this on CNN later and on CBS and, and a bunch of other programs. That Tom Stoner wanted to use the some of the wealth that he had amassed over the years to do something for the good of, of humanity. And it, well, he wanted it to be a very real thing. He didn't want his tombstone to say, here lies Tom Stoner, former owner of Stoner Broadcasting System. He wanted something assigned to the name Tom Stoner. Something, you know, he couldn't invent the Salk vaccine or the Sabin vaccine or, or any of those things, but he wanted to do something on that level. And he said to me, um, Gorbachev has opened this door. He's cracked it open. And he said, uh, we have to find out. He said, it's up to us to find out whether that's real or not. Whether he's serious about it. And I'm thinking, he's talking to me. Here's a guy, Tom Stoner, who was one handshake away from President Reagan. And this guy, was he was asked to be the national GOP chairman. He was a handshake away from the President of the United States. Now he's sitting across the table from me saying, I want you to do everything necessary to test Mikhail Gorbachev and see if this new democratization is a, is a real thing. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, that's up to you. He said, you, you decide how you're going to affect this. He said, keep me in the loop. Probably didn't use that cliche because it probably wasn't in vogue in those days. And, and Tom wouldn't have said that anyhow. But he said, keep me informed. And when you come up with an idea, let me know. Well, I thought and thought about it, and I, I couldn't go to any of my confidants because they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to get me fine-tuned on this because I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And so finally, it occurred to me that uh, 
Binghamton at that time had applied for sister city status with the Binghamton Boravici Sister Cities Pairing Project. Uh, but I faced a real obstacle. And the obstacle was that Tom Stoner is a conservative Republican. And the organizers of the Ground Zero organization, which kind of spearheaded the uh, pairing projects, the Sister Cities Pairing Projects, tends to be a pretty far left-wing organization. So I got them over here, and I got Tom Stoner over here, and I got me in the middle. And I went back to Tom Stoner, I said, here's, here's the avenue that I think that I want to take. I want to foster this Binghamton Boravici Sister Cities project as best I can, and, and use that as my springboard to get into the Soviet Union, which was still closed to uh, journalists. And Tom, he didn't say it immediately. He said, okay, go along with it. But then later he said to me, be careful of the political implications. He said, just be conscious of the fact that I am very close to the president and I am who I am. And I said, I'll, I'll be aware of that. Well, I began a very long process of doing something I had never done before in my life. I went from being the disc jockey, the morning show disc jockey in Binghamton, New York, and traveling around in these circles here, to all of a sudden, in a week's time, traveling around in the stratosphere with the uh, Soviet press attaché, the, the ambassador, the, the press ambassador, not the ambassador, but the yeah, I'm sorry, the ambassador, the Russian, the, the USSR ambassador to, and his press guy in, in Washington, and the State Department, the United States State Department, and Immigration Service, and meeting with the foreign correspondents in Washington, D.C., and in New York City, and flying up to Montreal and meeting with the foreign correspondents. You know, it's funny how all of us in our lifetime, we tend to, I guess we rise to the occasion. And, uh, but I don't mind telling you, it was emotionally a very very difficult thing for me to leave a meeting in Washington DC with the Secretary of State and then come back to Binghamton and do a morning show and give away uh, coupons uh, for lunch at uh, you know friendlies or whatever and then get a call or a fax or a telex or something in the middle of that 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 the Soviet national radio system in Moscow is on the line and they want to talk to you and I'm it was a very emotionally challenging kind of thing. But in, in any event, after a lot of planning and a lot of good fortune on, on the, over in Moscow, it was just the hand was dealt. The authorities in Moscow decided that if they were going to demonstrate this new openness, they were going to have to allow journalists to uh, travel through the country unescorted, and it just so happened, by the luck of the draw, we were the ones they selected. And they decided, much like we did, you know, we said, well, let's not go after Moscow, let's go, let's start in Borovici. And Moscow said, rather than inviting some national correspondents like Dan Rather or whoever, let's get a small town American team to come over here and see what they can do or, or what, what the end result will be. So, I searched and searched and searched around for a reason to do this, bearing in mind very honestly that I could not wholeheartedly embrace the notion of the, the liberal position of the Sister Cities Pairing Project, that, that that could not be my foundation. So I had to come up with another foundation. And God smiled on Amity and me many years ago when God allowed Joe Sobel, my AccuWeather forecaster, and I to develop a relationship beyond a professional relationship. We became, we have been very close personal friends for many years. And I thought to myself, what better conversation point is there worldwide than the weather? And who better to represent us in that arena than Dr. Joe Sobel? But we had another little problem that we had to deal with, and that is that Joe is Jewish. And in those days, Jews were not particularly welcome in the Soviet Union. They were an oppressed people. So we really tested the 
limits on this by saying not only are we going to bring a broadcast team to travel freely in the Soviet Union, one of them's a Jew. And they said, okay, fine with us. It turned into a media event. Every place we went, there were television cameras from Austria, from none from the United States, mind you. But every place uh, from Armenia, from all of the Soviet bloc countries, from Russia itself, Gostel Radio and Television, uh, Gostel Radio is what it tell, it's Gost State Tell Television Radio Radio. Every place we went, they followed us with cameras because they were saying, yes, folks, this is real. You see these uh, journalists, they are traveling around unescorted uh, without the view of uh, the government. <laughs> and uh, our first night in, uh, oh, I got dust on this, excuse me. This was our first night in Borovici. Uh, this is the uh, city hall here on, uh, this is Joe Sobel, right here. This is a fellow who accompanied us from uh, Chicago who uh, may have been involved in financing or helping to finance this project if it uh, had flourished, if, if this whole project had turned into a, an enterprise. These are the, some officials from uh, the Borovici City Council, um, myself, of course, the mayor, uh, the deputy mayor, Nikolai, and Tom Stoner who accompanied us. This was our very first night in Borovici. We, the reason we're wearing that headgear, except for me, is we were invited to a Russian bath and we all went into this Russian bath and then had uh, tea and vodka and uh, we uh, talked about grandchildren and we talked about hunting and we talked about everything other than politics that night. And you talk about the birth of your children, the birth of your grandchildren, your wedding day and all of these other important events that occur in your life. That night, this picture this here, this night, was the most significant night in my life. When that group of men got together and began what later became a huge uh, event, a, a talk show between the Soviet Union and the United States, that both Presidents Reagan and President Gorbachev, Presidents Reagan and Gorbachev, said independently, that that talk show that resulted as from that night was the turning point in the democratization of the Soviet Union, that it was the downfall of the last barrier, that it allowed the Soviets to demonstrate for the first time their right to freedom of speech. And they both said that once the citizens of the Soviet Union tasted the privilege of freedom of speech and talking on the radio on a talk show, that you couldn't stuff that genie back in a bottle. So it was that night that Tom Stoner realized his dream of etching forever in, in, in history, that he and his wealth was able to accomplish something. And uh, although it's not going to be written, uh, it's not going to go up on Mount Rushmore, we all know, all of us who were involved, and Tom knows, that we had not a small, but a very significant part in the turning point of the evil empire and the democratization of the Soviet Union. And that talk show that I referred to that was yet another year in the planning resulted from that night of meeting with these guys. And we said to them, that night when we were talking with the mayor of Borovici and his friend who ran a machine shop and so on, and we said, uh, if we did a talk show, if we hooked up the United States and the Soviet Union, and we allowed the citizens of both countries to talk to each other, what do you think we ought to talk about? And all of us around the table agreed we should not talk about politics, we should not talk about the Gulag archipelago, we should not talk about the prisons in Siberia, we should not talk about dissidents in the United States. We all agreed at that meeting that we should talk about education, family, and uh, employment education, family, and employment, and weather. The four common denominators in every civilization. And so it was then that when World Talk went on the air after another year of planning, where we hooked by satellite a studio in Moscow, a studio in Washington with me hosting, 
in in New York, in Washington, rather, and, and Yevgeny Pavlov hosting in Moscow. Those were the topics. And for two hours, we talked about education, family, weather. There wasn't much talk about weather. There was a little bit. Uh, and, and family and, and education and employment. And there was, it just was, it, it was just delicious. It was delicious, the whole thing. We were on the front page of every newspaper. We were on CBS, CNN. They were lined up outside the door of the studio when it was over with. Uh, 15 minutes of fame, boy, uh, there it was in its glory. And Tom Stoner was so happy to just be able to sit back, let me take all of the glory for this and appear. He didn't want to. He didn't want to talk on television. He wanted me to be on, but he knew that he engineered it and it was his idea. And it gave me an opportunity in my lifetime to, when the day comes that I will meet my maker, uh, probably my maker and I are going to have a conversation about this. And uh, uh, it's not going to be about those t uh, coupons at Friendly's and, and all of those, or the trip to Kathmandu or, or any of those things. Maybe a little bit of discussion about hopefully making some people happy along the way. But it's going to talk about how, how maybe we change the world for the better. And... Uh, um, to this day, it's a, that's been a lot of years, and it's still a very emotional thing for me. And you know, I say, and I sat earlier in this tape, and I said that I had no intention of coming back to Binghamton, but I believe there is a greater authority. And I'm not going to get preachy on you. And I'm not going to be like one of Bob Huckabone's Sunday Masses from St. Michael's. <laughs> but uh, I do believe, I really, in all of my life, I have believed that there that we are under the control of a greater authority, and that that uh, there is a God, and, and and all of these things happen for a reason. And um, I've seen it so so very often. And there was a reason that God had had Kitty come up there that night to Schenectady, to Albany. Uh, there was a reason I came back there. That was not in my plan. I don't make the plans. All I do, all we all do, is just live out the plan. And there was a reason that Tom Stoner came to me. There was a reason that I went to England and developed a reputation into Dirty Nellies so that Tom Stoner would come to me and ask me to do that and that we would be able to affect that. And as a result of all of that, not only do we have the personal knowledge now that we own that, we now own that emotion that we did that, but I had the good fortune of winning virtually every respected broadcast award that is offered. We were in. We were uh, winners in every category with these series of programs. Every category at the International Radio Festival in Holland. Uh, we were inducted into the uh, Broadcasters Hall of Fame in Chicago as a result of the World Talk. That was the name of the program. Was World Talk, and uh, it lived. It had a life of its own for a number of years. But then, of course, when Russia just became another entity, the interest in all of that lost was lost, and. So, so that that chapter was behind us, and um, that ended back in uh, probably it wound down in '93, and and I'll be absolutely painfully honest with you that when I returned to Binghamton in '93 full time, and went back to doing that morning show, after traveling in circles with Boris Yeltsin and uh, Gorbachev and and all of those people. There wasn't much attraction left to go in and do the morning show in Binghamton, and uh, the movement in those days was f less talk, more music, more information, more structured information. Uh, they asked me to do an afternoon talk show. I went in and did that for about a year, a year and a half. Talk shows are horrible things, all you guys. You know that. Tony, if you're looking, you know what it's like. <laughs> it is. It has a life of its own. You have to live, eat, sleep, breathe your talk show. You can't leave it. You can't walk away from it. If you say something, you have to live by it. Uh, you don't dare utter something you don't believe because suddenly your, your, your belief system has changed. And so talk shows are not like disc jockey shows. You, know, you tell a joke, people laugh at it, and they forget about it. You get on there, you make a comment about something, and people disagree with you, they remember it forever. And so very honestly, my heart was not... It was very difficult to get back up to that level of enthusiasm that I may have had back in the... And then very honestly, I wasn't a young guy anymore. I, I was now in my late 40s. And uh, 
And by the way, the guy that replaced me at WGY is now making 300 and some thousand dollars a year. <laughs> so if I'd hung in there. And so in 1995, um, I decided to try my hand at my own business. I didn't know what kind of a life that business was going to be. I thought it was going to be an advertising agency. I thought I was going to have a syndicated radio program. I thought it was going to be a lot of things. And uh, it was none of those. But very fortunately, I'm married to a dear woman, my wife Amity, whose income was adequate in the early years of my business. We were able to live. And I was able to develop my, uh, my new enterprise, World Radio, and now we... Uh, we have partners, media partners. Of, uh, we're on 250 radio stations nationwide, and every, literally every day that continues to grow. And, and our, our primary source of income now is, is rooted in, in broadcasting. Uh, but uh, for those of you who have known me for many years, you know that there was a tremendous weight loss in my life, uh, 123 pounds. And I thank the, uh, the, uh, my relationship with John Morgan, who, by the way, I worked with back in Syracuse at WFBL who became a hypnotherapist and was able to uh, give me the tools that were necessary to make a dramatic change in my life and to lose not only 123 pounds but to keep it off. And so having seen the value of that particular project, we've taken it on the road and we're taking it to radio markets, radio and television markets all across the United States and it's a huge enterprise right now uh, and uh, we have a lot of people working for us. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun, but I'm looking forward now as I conclude this. Uh, and I was scared to death when we started this, as I was talking with our uh, with Bob Huckabone, who's, who's actually shooting this and was kind enough to ask me to do it. I said, you know, I don't, want, I don't know what I want to talk about, Bob. I said, I, it's, it's interesting to me. It's interesting to my family. I've, I find it very difficult to believe that it would be interesting to anybody else. But if you want me to do it, please ask me a bunch of questions, and I'll be glad to sit down and answer your questions. So as soon as I saw the tally light come on, probably 35 minutes ago, I haven't stopped. And so I conclude there were a lot of other things along the way that I wanted to talk about. But it just, it's not fair to all of you who wanted a thumbnail sketch of this. I, I loved, I mean, there is no greater thrill in the world than to open the microphone and be able to shape public opinion. There's no greater thrill in the world than to be able to do something that benefits a lot of people and to use the resources that you have at your disposal. I miss that. When I see a wrong, I still want to right it. I still miss being able to get on the air and being able to raise money, to be able to get coats for the, for the homeless. Uh, I, I miss those kinds of things. But there are, there's a whole slew of young people out there now who do a very effective job of that. And so I'm going to continue to do what I do. And uh, I now own all of those memories from all of those years in broadcasting, from the $2 bill Mystery Money Man or the $3 bill Mystery Money Man, to the democratization of the Soviet Union, and to the day-to-day -day giving away of uh, $20 gift certificates at Friendly's. And all of those things that went into uh, my lifelong dream of being in broadcasting. And I'm not ready to retire yet. I'm close to it. I, I really would like to get to where I'm just playing more golf than I am working. But there are a lot of people currently relying on my leadership in World Radio. And so this is 2003, um, April of the year. I'm hoping that by 2005 I will be in full retirement in our... We're going to be in our new home in July of this year, and I hope to be in full retirement uh, by 2005. And uh, for those of you who have been friends of mine in broadcasting, I really appreciate all of the uh, opportunities to make your acquaintance. And uh, if you were jealous of all the money I made, too bad. <laughs> That's it. All i got to say, thank you.